All right, everyone, welcome to this PowerPoint on generalists and specialists, K and R selected species, and survivorship curves for AP environmental science. So we're now getting into our populations unit, um, and this PowerPoint is going to cover three topics. Topic 3.1, which is generalists and specialists. Uh, the learning objective for that is identify differences between generalists and specialist species, and the enduring understanding is going to be the same for all of these, that populations change over time in reaction to a variety of factors. We're looking at topic 3.3, survivorship curves, which we should just be able to explain what a survivorship curve is. And topic 3.2, KNR selected species. This one is just on this slide and they're out of order one, two, three, just so that um, I can get this one, which is a has a lot more essential knowledge all on one slide. Okay, but there's really no reason that I have this on this slide. So all three of those learning objectives um, pretty well mesh together, which is why we're talking about three of them all in one um, PowerPoint. Uh, the vocab, just like normal, I'm gonna skip, but you can uh, pause this now and jot this down. So because this is the first PowerPoint for the populations unit, we're just gonna start to talk about what a population is. So a population, um, the biology uh, scientific definition of it is all the individuals of a single species that live in a defined geographic area and have the potential to interbreed. So all of these penguins over here on the bottom right are all one population. They may be isolated from other such populations. Maybe they are isolated from another population on another island or in a different geographic area. Okay, um, but all one species in a defined geographic area that have the potential to interbreed. And we've already talked about um, specialists and generalists. So just remember what those two things are. Remember that specialists are species with narrow ecological niches, and they often will depend on a single habitat, maybe one or a few food sources, and tolerate a narrow range of climatic conditions, one or more of those things, um, as well as some others. They do very well when conditions are stable, when the bamboo forest is um, continuing for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, couple million years, pandas are going to do very well because they are specialized for eating bamboo. But they can go extinct when conditions change. So if the bamboo forest disappears, then the panda will disappear with them. Generalists, on the other hand, those are species with wide ecological niches. They can adapt to live in a variety of different habitats. They can eat a variety of different things or live on a variety of different soil types if they're plants, and they tolerate a wide range of um, climatic conditions. They don't specialize for one general thing, but they are generalists and can get many different, um, can fill many different niches. Okay, they have high competition with resources. Not only are they competing with specialists in their range, but they're also competing with other generalists. Um, but they tend to do very well when uh, conditions change. So they tend to survive a little bit longer during an extinction event. So because we've already talked about this in our biodiversity unit, I'm going to essentially skip this slide, but you may want to pause this now to review um, specialists versus generalists a little bit more. And moving right along to R and K selection theory, this was coined by MacArthur and Wilson, who you should remember from the um, theory of island biogeography, and this was based off of their work with the theory of island biogeography. Lucky for you, we are not going to do any math for this, even though it is uh, quantitative. But we're just going to be able to describe them, um, describe um, R and K selected uh, species um, qualitatively, okay? You will also see the terms R and K strategists rather than R and K selected species. I will tend to say the word strategist. It's a little, it's becoming a little bit more outdated, um, but it's the way that I learned it and it's kind of ingrained in my head. So I'm probably gonna say R and K strategists, but I'm gonna try to say selected species. Just know that they're um, synonyms, okay? And I do want you to note, and we'll talk about this again when we talk about survivorship curves, which are on the bottom right, that nature doesn't really fall into discrete little bins. Not every species is going to be 100% a K species or 100% an R species um, because nature doesn't really work that way. Nature is a continuum. There's a lot of variation. And humans like to describe things as discrete little groups or discrete little bins. And that's not how nature works. It's how our brains like to operate. And we try to impose that structure on nature. And nature doesn't really work that way. So there is many species that don't um, display the traits of um, R and K selection theory 100% all the time and there's many species that are kind of in between there's many exceptions to this rule but in general many species do follow the rule 
And let's start with K-selected species or K-strategists. These tend to, and all of this really, um, I should point out, is based off of um, the way that these animals breed and raise their young, okay? So K-selected species tend to be very large. They tend to mature slowly, meaning that they take a long time to reach reproductive age, and they tend to have long lifespans, relatively speaking. They tend to have one or a few offspring per reproductive cycle. So this rhino only has one calf, okay? Um, and every time that this rhino breeds, she's just gonna have one calf. Now, because they have long lifespans, they can have many reproductive cycles throughout their life, many reproductive events throughout their life. So they can have, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight offspring, depending on the species. Okay. They tend to invest a lot of energy in their young. That could be in utero, meaning in the uterus, if it is a, um, if it is a mammal, a placental mammal rather. Um, it could be a lot of energy in egg yolk. So one reason that albatross have very large eggs and only have one or two chicks at a time is because they invest a ton of energy into their yolks, okay? which the developing embryo uses as nutrients. The endosperm, basically the yolk for seeds, even though a botanist would uh, hate for me to say that, as well as post-care birth. So both this rhino and this gorilla are providing post-care, or sorry, both post-birth care to their offspring. They're protecting their offspring, they're nurturing their offspring, okay? Um, K-selected case species tend to reproduce more than once throughout their life, like we talked about up here. Um, they're often specialists, okay? When you see K-selected species, think specialists. Don't really think generalists, although many of them can be generalists, but again, um, just the way that we tend to organize data in our brains, um, associate case-selected species with specialists. Their um, reproductive curves or their reproductive graphs tend to be logistic or S-curves, meaning that, I'll show a graph of this on another slide, meaning that if there is a carrying capacity in that ecosystem, and we'll talk about carrying capacity later if you don't remember it from biology, they tend to get up to carrying capacity and then just level off, okay? They have this period at the beginning where they, um, where the population is growing very slowly because they only have one or a few offspring at a time. And then they get to a population size that can um, show a little bit more exponential growth. There's many reproductive females um, in that population and they are breeding um, below carrying capacity and they're having lots of, lots of births and then it tends to level off right at or below carrying capacity, okay? So that's what I mean by a logistic or an S curve. You notice that's vaguely an S shape. And we're talk when we're talking about survivorship curves, they tend to be type one or type two survivorship curves. And we'll talk about that later on in this PowerPoint. Some examples of that, humans. We are a classic example. We're relatively large for primates. We have relatively long lifespans. We have one or two, rarely three, I mean, even two is rare, um, offspring per reproductive event. And we can have multiple reproductive events during our lifetime. And we invest a lot of energy in our young, probably the most energy in our young um, for any animal or any mammal. Okay, but all of these other ones, elephants, whales, pandas, et cetera, are all case uh, case too. We can contrast case selected species with our selected species um, or our strategists. These tend to be small compared to their case selective um, uh, relatives. They tend to mature quickly and have short lifespans. They tend to have many offspring per reproductive event. Some of them live so short that they only reproduce once during their life and they have lots and lots of offspring during that one reproductive event. Some of them can have multiple reproductive events and have multiple offspring per each one. Okay, an example of the latter would be a mouse. A mouse can breed several times, sometimes even twice a year, um, and has maybe a dozen offspring per reproductive event. Rather than investing a lot of energy into one offspring, what they're doing is playing a numbers game. They know that you know 11 out of the 12 baby mice are going to die before they reach reproductive age, but one of them is probably, you know, at least one is probably going to make it to reproductive age, have a lot of offspring itself, and continue that um, that species, that population. Okay, um, they're often generalists, just like with what I said with case-selected species. 
associate our selected species with generalists. They can be specialists, but associate generalists with our selected species, okay? They tend to have a J curve, and I'll show this again on another slide, but essentially what's going on is that they have a population boom, say if there's a carrying capacity, and then they drop drastically, and then they have a population boom, and then drop drastically. We call that a boom and bust cycle, okay? So that J curve is this part right here, that kind of J exponential growth. And they, they tend to have a type three survivorship curve, which again, we'll talk about later. Some examples, bacteria, diatoms, many annual plants. So this purple loosestrife can have, you know, 10,000 offspring. Um, actually, sorry, that's not a purple loosestrife, and purple loosestrife is not an annual. That is a thistle. I'm not sure what species it is, but it's a thistle. And that thistle could have, let's say, 10,000 seeds um, that it produces through one reproductive event during its lifetime, and then it dies. Okay. All right, so this is, these are the graphs I was referencing. Um, say that we have, I'll do carrying capacity in black up here for the K selected species. So carrying capacity is K, which is why K selected species are called that because they level out right at K, um, right at carrying capacity, which is abbreviated as K on a graph. Um, your K selected species tend to have a period of short, um, sorry, tend to have a short period of exponential growth before they level off right at carrying capacity. Your R strategists, this isn't really showing it as well as I would hope, but it's a pretty good graph nonetheless. They tend to have a lot of exponential growth. They tend to have very rapid exponential growth, and then um, conditions might change slightly, or they um, outstrip their carrying capacity, they overgraze an area, let's say, or they over um, eat their food source, and then their populations plummet. And then a few survive, and then they bounce back, and then plummet again, and they continue to do that over and over and over again, all right? So they have what is called a J curve. Related to those two curves is biotic potential. Biotic potential is the maximum reproductive rate of a population during ideal conditions. Um, it's represented as these green arrows on this graph so biotic potential is the time period at, you know, here, here, I'll do it in a different color, all along that graph. You can think of it as this space above the line below the carrying capacity. Okay, that is biotic potential on this graph. It's a period of exponential growth. So we have exponential growth right here, and we are seeing that period of exponential growth. Conditions are ideal. Conditions are great. You have plenty of food. You don't have um, a lot of disease because the population isn't that large yet. Um, plenty of water, plenty of nutrients in the soil if you're a plant. Whatever it is, plenty of space, you have ideal conditions. And your population is going to grow and grow and grow. Um, even if it's a case strategist, um, they're going to experience exponential growth. So two rhinos come together, make one baby, and then that population is now three, and then, um, you know, they reproduce again, then it's four, and then, you know, continuing that, reprodu like that reproduction, you're going to get, you know, more and more and more and more rhinos. Again, we could mathematically model this and show that it is exponential, but luckily we don't have to for this class. So why does all this matter for environmental science? The reason that it matters relates back to our biodiversity unit. Um, K strategists tend to be more prone to population declines due to human impacts. That could be overexploitation, like we see here uh, with whaling on the Faroe Islands, where whaling is still legal. Um, it would definitely be overexploitation if they were not monitoring this population and they were not um, and they were not uh, having permits and legal. Uh, processes for whaling, but we can use it as an example of overexploitation regardless. Competition with invasive species. So this native mussel to, or this native clam to the Great Lakes is being overrun by these small zebra mussels that are literally growing all over it. Okay. Um, it could be due to climate change or to um, habitat loss, any of those things that we've talked about with HIPCO. Habitat loss is actually a big one because most of these case selected species are large, large animals and large animals need a lot of room to roam. They need large ranges. So habitat loss is going to 
disproportionately impact K strategists than it will R strategists. Okay. And then if we can contrast that with our R selected species, they are less prone to being outcompeted, they're less prone to overexploitation, they're less prone to going extinct and changing conditions. In fact, many of these invasive species that we're worried about are R strategists. Some, some examples of those are rats and mice, annual weedy plants tend to be R strategists, uh, feral pigs, starlings, etc. Now, like I said, with specialists and generalists, many species do not fit the mold and they don't neatly conform to either being an R strategist or a K strategist. Again, nature is a continuum and nature has a lot of variation while humans try to categorize things into nice, neat little file folders. So some exceptions to the rule. Many trees are large and long lived, but they produce thousands of seeds um, potentially every year or every couple years that could be widely dispersed. Great example of that would be a maple tree. You guys all probably know uh, the maple trees have those little helicopter seeds that float down to the ground or you know, settle down to the ground really slowly. Um, those can be carried by the wind, great distances, and a single maple tree that can live for 200, 500 years can produce thousands of seeds every year. Okay. Another example is sea turtles. If we're looking at an animal example, they're large and they're long lived, but they produce dozens of eggs per reproductive event. They provide no parental care. Once the mother lays these eggs and she goes back to the sea, she will never see these offspring. And many of these offspring are going to die before they reach reproductive age, um, either in the mad dash to the ocean um, or in the ocean itself. Okay, so they have some traits of K strategists and some traits of R strategists um, at the same time. Okay, so there is some criticism of R and K selection theory, and there is the rise of some alternate life history theories, but you don't need to know those for this class. These are the only ones, um, R and K uh, strategists um, are the only ones that you need to know for our learning objectives. And finally, survivorship curves. These are graphical representations. You'll see them pretty much always like that. Um, maybe some different animals as, um, or sorry, different organisms as exemplars, but pretty much like that. This represents one generation from birth through adulthood, and it's on a logarithmic scale, okay? And it's showing the relative proportion of individuals in that generation. Okay, so if we start off with a thousand humans in a generation, or if we start off with a thousand um, birds or a thousand trees, all right? And we're tracking them through that generation. So their age in relative units. So for humans, for example, this is a type one or K strategist, um, type one selection curve or K strategist. Most of them are going to survive throughout their infanthood. They're getting older and older and older. They're gonna, most of them are gonna survive. Obviously you'll have a few that die from accidents, from disease, from whatever, but most humans are gonna survive to reproductive age, okay? Because again, we, pre we invest so heavily in our offspring. We nurture our offspring um, for let's say 18 years in general. You know, you'll hit reproductive age, and then more and more individuals start to die, well, will have died during reproductive age, right? Accidents, disease, et cetera, maybe predation. And then we reach an age where many people die very quickly, right? 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, depending on where you are in the world and medical conditions in that society. But eventually, let's say at 110, there is the last oldest person of that generation, and then after that, that generation is done for. Okay, so this is showing one generation. We could do the same thing with our type two. Let's say that we have, instead of this bird, which looks more like a uh, osprey or an eagle or a hawk or something, let's say we have ducks. Ducks are a good example of a type two curve. They provide quite a bit of parental care. They're still what what I would probably classify as a case strategist, but you're on that border there of exceptions to the rule, but they will display a type two curve. They have quite a few offspring. They invest quite a lot of yolk to that egg, and they provide a lot of um, post birth or post hatching parental care. So let's say that you have an egg that gets predated on, you know, you, you have your thousand ducks in a generation, but I'm gonna focus on one family unit. Let's say that you have that one egg that's predated on by a snake, and then they, the rest of them hatch and one of them quickly dies. Um, 
from predation and another one dies from predation, you're reaching reproductive age and a couple more are dying from predation and about half of your little ducklings survive to reproductive age. And they will, or in this case, a 10th of them survive to reproductive, uh, sorry, 1% survive to reproductive age. Um, and then they reproduce and then they live out their adult life. And you eventually have that six-year-old duck that is old and the last one of its generation. Okay. But the point is, is that they're consistently and constantly being predated on or being um, killed from disease or accidents or whatever throughout their entire lifespan. Okay. So age does not correlate with survivorship for a type two curve. And then you have type three. This would be in this example, a tree. Let's just say that this is your maple tree. Um, actually that is an acorn. So it's an oak tree. Um, and we have our thousand trees. They all are in one relatively small area. And most of them are going to be outcompeted by the two or three saplings that grow up the fastest. And then of the, like, so most of them are going to die very early on. And then, um, you know, maybe they'll be browsed. Maybe they'll be outcompeted by their neighbors. Maybe they will um, befall an accident or a fire or something. And only a few of them are going to survive into a juvenile stage and then maybe one or two or three is going to survive into adulthood to therefore give that thousand seeds every year like a tree will okay but that could be a mouse you could have um, your entire mouse family your 20 mice and then they're eaten and eaten and eaten and eaten and eaten and eaten only a couple make it to um, the juvenile stage and then they're eaten and eaten and then only one or two of them reach adulthood and then they um, reproduce, continue that generation, that population, and then a couple of very fortunate mice may survive and die of old age. All right. So that's how you read these graphs. Now I have a question for you. How would you characterize this type of curve? Pause this, think about it for a second, and then we'll talk about it. Okay. This is a curve that is also going to be a type one curve or very similar to your classic type one. But what this is showing is that you have individuals that are dying very early on in infancy. And then once they reach a critical age, they're going to survive pretty well throughout their childhood, through their juvenile years until they reach reproductive age. And then they're going to survive pretty well during their reproductive um, age and then die of old age. Okay, so that could be something like a, um, like, let's say a rhino, okay, or a chimpanzee, or something that is a large animal that is pretty much immune from predation once it reaches a certain size, but it has to get past that critical stage of infancy. Let's say like a sauropod dinosaur, right? Your tiny little sauropod dinosaur, your long necked dinosaur, right? Long neck, long tail dinosaur. Um, it's going to have this this age when it is going to easily be predated upon by all your theropod dinosaurs, think T-Rex. And then once it reaches a critical size, it has grown larger than all of the predators can um, can handle, can take down. So they're going to live pretty well throughout their late juvenile into reproductive age, adulthood lives, and then die of old age. Okay, so but there's that, there's still type one and there's still that critical time at the beginning um, when they're infants so that they have to survive. Okay, so you, you may see this curve come up um, every once in a while. All right, so this PowerPoint, we talked about specialists and generalists, um, skipping to the essential knowledge. Specialist species tend to be advantaged in habitats that remain constant. Think your pandas in your bamboo forest or your koalas and your eucalyptus forest. As long as the bamboo or the eucalyptus remains, they're gonna be fine. But generalists tend to be advantaged when in habitats that change. 
Okay, they're more likely to adapt to those changing conditions, and they're more likely to survive on those changing conditions as a population or as a species as a whole. Survivorship curves, again, skipping ahead to topic 3.3, um, a survivorship curve is a line that displays the relative survival of a cohort that's going to be an age group. Okay, so one generation in your population for birth to the maximum age reached by any one member of that cohort. There's type 1, type 2, and type 3. You should be able to describe each one of those. Survivorship curves differ for K-selected um, and R-selected species. K-selected tend to be type 1 or type 2, whereas your R-selected tend to be your type 3. Okay, not tend to be, they are. Okay, again, that type 2 is a little bit of your in-betweens, but we'll say that they're K-strategists. Okay, and finally, R and K selection theory. Um, we talked about K strategists and how they tend to be large, have few offspring, yada, yada, yada. Now, this clause, competition for resources and K selected species habitat is usually relatively high. Um, what that is essentially saying is that if you have all of your, um, you only have K selected species, let's say giant pandas, and they're only specialists for bamboo, they are going to compete with each other, members of the same species for the same resources. So it's gonna be relatively high levels of competition because they all need the same resources, okay? We talked about our selected species and all the characteristics of those. And this clause here, competition for resources in our selected species habitats is relatively low. That's because they are generalists, and rather than competing with members of the same species for the same food sources, they will diversify and um, go after many types of different food sources. Now that is maybe contrary to what I said earlier, where specialists tend to avoid competition be by niche partitioning, um, but they're avoiding competition between different species. What I think that this is talking about is competition within the same species. So intraspecific competition. Okay, um, whereas generalists, I said earlier, um, face more competition from all the specialists and all the other generalists in their habitat, right? The, um, the American black bear is facing competition from all of the deer and the elk that it's um, competing with for grazing. It's uh, facing competition with all of uh, the birds that it's, that it's facing for berries and the wolves and the coyotes for the meat. It's facing lots of competition from everywhere uh, as well as other bears. But if we just narrow our scope down to other bears, they're limiting competition because they can go to different foodstuffs at different times. Pretty sure I think that that's what the, what that's saying. To be honest, um, those two sentences there, they they throw me a little bit of a trip. Okay, and then we talked about biotic potential, the maximum reproductive rate of, of a population, ideal conditions. And then part two, the second page of this, many species have reproductive strategies that are not uniquely R or K selected species. Um, they tend to just be constant, but they can change their reproductive strategy at different times. We didn't really talk about that. Um, I haven't seen any questions that deal with it, so I skipped it. Um, K-selected species are typically more adversely affected by invasive species than our selected species. Our um, selected species tend to actually be your invasive species. Okay, so I hope you guys learned something. I'll see you on class.